Sibelius, I've got to give you some insight here. Sibelius didn't want to go to Italy either. In 1901, he was depressed. His, his composing had come to a standstill. The death of his daughter had been a terrible blow, and he was alcoholic, increasingly so. His marriage was on the rocks. He was deeply concerned about the domination and oppression of Finland by the Russians. A friend said, go to Italy as a tonic. And he went and he reported, everything here is lovely, even the ugly. <laughs> And as we all know, everyone feels better in Italy. Now, other composers have gone to Italy, as you know, Tchaikovsky and Rimsky-Korsakov and Mendelssohn and Strauss and Wolf, and they all went to Italy and they came home with Italian serenades and Italian symphonies and souvenirs de Florence. Sibelius came home from Rapallo with a good mood. He loved the Mediterranean sunshine and it lifted his spirits enough so he could compose the most universally loved symphony he ever composed. And uh, the uh, symphony that ends in a blaze of glory. But it is a symphony that describes Finland, not Italy. Indeed, we know Finland, its lakes and fjords and vast distances and jagged rocks and streams and mountains and weird northern light. We know that from Sibelius's music. And um, we probably wouldn't have had the Second Symphony if Sibelius hadn't gone to Italy, but it was definitely a picture of his homeland. A little background. Sibelius was musically isolated. He did not participate in the European uh, mode. The prevailing mood amongst composers in Europe and artists was disillusionment, nervous reaction to materialism, excessive sophistication. Tonality had broken up. Modulation didn't mean anything anymore because everything modulated. Uh, French Impressionism, Russian folk art, Stravinsky, Rite of Spring, Ives, atonal music, none of that meant anything to Sibelius. He, didn't in, he wasn't interested. While Berlioz was looking forward with one of the most revolutionary musical inventions, Sibelius was looking back and he composed symphonies in recognizable forms and in recognizable classical keys. Tchaikovsky was in the background, but every Sibelius never sounds like anyone but himself. Now, here's the very interesting thing. He did not compose tunes. He composed fragments, um, not melodies, but kind of neutral material, disconnected units. And then he forged them into a marvelous cohesion. And it was a new way of composing. And he described it in a very beautiful way. He said, it is as if the Almighty had thrown down the pieces of a mosaic from heaven's floor and asked me to put them together. Isn't that a beautiful idea. So if you take the opening, it's like this. <laughs> That's all. I mean, that's a very odd thing to do. And then he does it again. That's kind of, it's like an accompaniment. And then the oboe is going. And then the horns do something. And then the flutes go. And then the silence, and then the bassoons, a little tentative. It's like a fanfare, but it should be on the trumpets. And then the, f the flutes do a kind of laughter. And then the violins, without any accompaniment. It's just little bits and pieces. It's, it's kind of strange. Um, everything's dissolving into silence. And then there's that half-hearted fanfare and snatches of tunes and rhythms. Now he's going to build this all together in, from a mosaic. And there are also curious mood swings. Suddenly, from tenderness, he goes to savagery and then again silence. 
And I want to introduce one theme, which goes with a long note, a very long note, long held, and then a little convulsion. And ending with this interval. And that's a very important interval because it comes over and over again, that. Whirring strings, like precision machine or maybe a, a stream running. Each of these elements is very memorable, so you will remember them. They are seared into your brain because they are so distinctive. Like, you don't forget that once you've heard it. And these elements are like that. In fact, Beethoven and Sibelius had a lot in common. They both love these brief motivic kernels. I've got one more for you, and it's this falling fifth. That's, you'll find it everywhere and hear it. Now you've got all the pieces. That's all the pieces of the mosaic I've given you. And now the rest of the movement is in a sonata form, takes the form of a sonata, first theme, second theme, development, and uh, it all comes, starts to come together. And in the development, you hear it all together, and you feel this elemental power and drive. It reaches higher and higher and higher and higher, like climbing a mountain. And then finally, you get a high B-flat, long B-flat. Da -da 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 Again, with that convulsive thing. All the materials that were presented very unemotionally at the beginning suddenly become coalesce into a huge, majestic brass fanfare. Remember those bassoons? You'll hear it on the trumpets and the trombones. And so you feel as though there's an immense natural force released. And all you can think about is the vast images of nature because only nature can provide the grandeur of Sibelius's music. Now, the second movement is quite a tough knot, but I want to tell you something very exciting about it, which is it has been played wrong by everybody, including us, last Thursday, and I made an amazing discovery. And you, if you know the piece, you're going to be very shocked, because instead of hearing at the basses at the beginning, which is what we all play, um, you're going to hear this. And it's the reason for that is um, because he actually left a metronome mark. And it makes a great deal more sense. I think you're going to find it, those of you who know the piece, are going to find it all hanging together in a way that... Um, now, I discovered that yesterday. But the concert was on Thursday. So the concert on Thursday, we just did what all I knew about the piece. Isn't that kind of exciting? I had this revelation. I heard a recording uh, of a piece uh, by a conductor who Sibelius knew and loved and gave his support to and his imprimatur. And he, that's the way he played it. And then it was made in 1930. And so I, I started looking and I found the metronome mark for the movement and I announced this morning that we were going to be completely different. And they all looked horrified. <laughs> <laughs> but they did it. And it was great. And, and there's a sad, dark song on the bassoons, like a folk song telling a Nordic saga. And then a savage little figure in the strings. <laughs> And always that end, and that becomes a slow theme. Always that falling fifth. We always hear that. And then these terrifying outbursts in the brass. It's very, very dramatic. And the tempo helps. It all gels together. No symphony before the Sibelius had expressed the forbidding grandeur of nature at its most awe-inspiring. You feel you're seeing mountain crags and forests and demons. Sibelius was the first great master of the North. He presents the elemental power of music rooted in the organic world. All austere grandeur. That is uniquely Sibelius. 
Uh, apparently, he went for a walk with a friend, and he was sitting, listening, and the friend went off for about three hours and came back, and he was sitting there in the same position. And the friend said, what are you doing? He said, I'm listening for the fundamental tone. And that's what we hear, and it's wonderful to play. Look in this space. This is a musical space, and you'll hear that music going up into the height of the... The scherzo is very fast and has a very specific metronome mark of 92, which is very fast. It's stormy and windblown and incredibly ruthless in its savagery, although some of it is quite soft, but with a demonic quality. It seems as though you're listening to the winds howling, the winds of hell, as fast as you can play. I, I sometimes imagine a ship seen occasionally over huge waves. You hear it in the distance, but it's a ceaseless drive all the way. Ten pages of it, then silence, complete mystery, and there are five beats on the drum, each one getting softer. And now comes an amazing thing, a trio, a middle section. And the trio is, um, consists of nine notes, nine times the same note. Now, no composition teacher would ever recommend that somebody do that. But when you hear it, you'll be amazed. Uh, no, that's right, here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's so beautiful, it's so touching and sad and poignant. It's an oboe solo, very beautifully played by Peggy Pearson. And we seem to know the story before it happens because that falling fifth, which we've heard so often. And then it goes back to the storm A section and then again the B section. But the B section, the, the, the trio doesn't end. It leads into the finale with majestic rising scales. Now, I want to introduce one more uh, motive. You notice at the beginning, and then when the oboe comes in, dum bum bum bi. So you've got a rising three blind mice and a falling three blind mice. And though that figure of the three blind mice, the three notes, is everywhere, hundreds and hundreds of examples. And at the end of the piece, it suddenly comes to the fore as the main theme. And it's a very beautiful and dramatic theme. When it first appears out of these rising scales, you suddenly get out of this, uh, out of this sense a, a, a rising scale consisting just of those three notes. That's the theme of the last movement, and there's a sense of absolute uh, uh, rightness after you've heard it so many times when it comes to the forefront. And the trombones are going ba 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 ba, ba 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 ba, ba 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 ba, like a great engine throbbing. It breaks up. And we go into one of Sibelius's moto perpetuo sections. And this is based on something very similar. If you've ever played the piano, you've practiced five note exercises. That's the five note exercise, which is going on in the, in the bass. And it's like has the majesty of the ocean swelling, a hypnotic power. And it grows and it grows and you grows and you think this is the big climax. But it isn't, it's just a dress rehearsal. <laughs> it's like climbing a small mountain in preparation for the big one. And the last 16 pages of this piece are so amazing because finally he comes to that five finger exercise, which is, starts off in the cellos and violas and then grows and grows and grows. And above it, <laughs> oh, no, 
voice and it starts climbing and climbing and growing and climbing and climbing and you think it must be the end it must be at the top and if you've ever climbed a mountain and you know that feeling when you think you're there and you're not there and you still go on and it's sad but oh, it's so beautiful and so sad in D minor, D minor, and your heart seems to break, and finally, finally, it breaks into, bursts into D major. And it's one of the greatest moments in all of music. And I, I'm thrilled to look out and see a lot of young people here who are hearing this for the first time in a great concert hall with a great orchestra because they will never forget this moment. It is that feeling of climbing, you're exhausted, you've suffered, you've worked hard, and suddenly the world is spread out beneath you and you look at it in an exalted state, a state of pure exaltation, spiritual exaltation. And it's something that only music can do. It's an amazing experience, and every member of the orchestra is feeling it to the depths of their soul. And I, I know that you will too. By the end, we are transported to a different world that words simply cannot describe.